fairly uh, standard strategies, but not the strongest play from him. Uh, I think that I've liked a lot of the decks that have been brought, but I think he has been quite consistently, at least as the pressure starts to mount, letting himself, uh, let the nerves get the better of him, letting everything get a bit on top of him. Whereas this week we are seeing a very standard lineup. Yeah, again, Demon Hunter, Warrior, Druid, and uh, the Highland Hunter, I think is as, as standard as it gets for APAC this week. Uh, whereas for Kin, it's kind of been the other way around for me. It's been weird lineup prep, weird decks, but overall very strong play. Yes, uh, for Kin, he was one of the earliest of Priest, so it really shocks me to see that I think Priest is at its strongest and best mm. uh, uh, timing. Kin has foregone the Delta together and has now defaulted onto probably four of the most common decks we would be seeing outside of, say, Hunter instead of Rogue. Uh, he is now banning Warrior, though, so I do like seeing that, especially since he has no longer got Priest. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty uh, inexcusable now, as was a hot take a couple of weeks ago, to not be banning Warrior with this exact lineup. Even as we've run through all the different reasonings of Druid being the same versus Warrior or Demon Hunter, I was still left quite perplexed by Surrender's strategy of, uh, we saw earlier today where he had this very similar lineup, but decided to get rid of the Demon Hunter instead. It worked out for him, of course, here, but just with the uh, Warriors out of the way, we are left with almost identical lineups. The only difference being, of course, the Rogue instead of the Hunter. Do you have any thoughts as to who that should favor, Gia? When I first looked at the decks, I tended to favor the Rogue just because of the mm -hmm. early removal lining up well against Hunter minions. Just uh, given the basic idea that Rogue likes to deal with a few tall minions because of cards like Sap and effects like uh, Blackjack Stunner, Whereas Hunter likes to play just one minion on curve. That should favor the rogue in terms of tempo. But because Hunter these days are running untargetables like Fairy Dragon and Evasive mm -hmm. Bellwing, and Rogue is cutting SI7 a lot of the times, that can be really problematic in the early game, compounds the damage, and then Rogue doesn't have the healing for later on. It's a very complicated matchup, I agree. And I think Rogue is in a perfectly decent spot here. The only matchup that it really, really, really doesn't want to face, in my opinion, is the Druid. Even Warrior wouldn't be that bad with that band out of the way. Demon Hunter's fine, Hunter is fine, even if they're slightly unfavorable. Um, it, it's just the fact that Warrior, I think it, uh, the Druid, it struggles so hard to beat because it has very, very limited answers indeed to the Glowfly. Maybe I'm overestimating it, but for Kin, that for me is the one to pray that he dodges. Yeah, I can definitely get behind that. As far as the rest of the decks are lining up, I don't think I'm seeing anything too out of the ordinary from the lists. But you brought up a while ago that Chansu's play has been honestly very shaky lately, as early as yesterday, even though he did get a win versus Surrender. We were seeing a lot of divergence with this play from what we thought would be ideal in those scenarios. And then previous weeks, we were seeing just objective mistakes due to roping out and others maybe not considering what could have been saved for an altruist lethal later on. So I really hope that Chansu has, uh, with his recent win against Surrender, gotten in a better mental space and will be playing at his best level. And I, I always wonder what is going through the players, of the, he uh, the players' heads when they're in these stressful scenarios. Because I think for some of the newcomers, it's very understandable to think, uh, I haven't earned my place here yet. You know, I did well in a Masters Tour, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have what it takes to fight with the best of the best in Grand Masters. But for Chonsu, he had a very successful season uh, in Season 2 of Grand Masters last year, almost getting through to the Global Finals. He's been playing Hearthstone for a long, long time. I hope he doesn't think he hasn't earned his spot here because he absolutely has. He just needs to show to us that he can show us the consistency that he has at the top level of play. Funny type of spin on the story given that he is the newcomer between these two, but I can totally True. see where you're coming from because Sean Su had some of the highlights of his career a fair few years ago. I think I would would say 2015, 2016 Hearthstone, and outside of that performance in Scene 2 GM, maybe he hasn't had a big finish that he would have wanted to get. So even though it's against a newcomer, Chansu can still prove a lot. Well, he's going to have to with the first match of the series. Hunter versus Rogue, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, it is in no small part on the Rogue, I think, to try and swing the, uh, the tempo back into their advantage using all their little tempo tricks, which at the moment looks like it might be fairly 
difficult as this hand is staying afloat for the moment, but it is missing a lot of the power cards for early on. The upside for Kin, though, is that the Blowtorch Saboteur on Curve, a tech I think was made mostly with Demon Hunter in mind, has a pretty good upside for Shansu's hand in particular if he wants to save the Phase Stalker for the same turn mm. activation as a hero power. That's it would true. be pretty expensive to do so. As it stands, though, I think Shansu is just going to play this Phase Stalker even if it dies straight up to the Spy Mistress just to present something onto the board and hopefully curve out with Bone Wraith later on. Ooh! I was definitely looking at the Frozen Shadow Eater here because it lines up pretty well against the potential of a Storm Hammer coming down, of course, right. and being able to swing in. But this also lines up pretty well against the Storm Hammer because it can't be killed off. And then you can just freeze them after they equip a weapon later on or freeze a minion if it comes down on this turn. I think this is good sequence. We like it. Forkin here, he is choosing to proc the secret immediately. He doesn't know whether it's Freezing or Snake. Those are the only two run in Shansu's mm -hmm. deck. But I wonder if that was an auto attack there, given that he really oh, wants to land a Frozen... Uh, sorry, a Faceless Corruptor for next turn. I was thinking she'll to just... Play the Frozen Shadow Weaver and leave your Blowtorch on board. Yeah. Well, the real negative of this play comes into apparent now with the uh, one of the most devastating tempo swings that Hunter has available in the Rot Nest Drake. And Kin is left with very, very little to do against this sheer onslaught. He needs to pray that nothing can be put in the way of this Rot Nest Drake. But he is going to be met with some sad news, I think, after Bone Wraith comes down. I mean, for Ken, he was thinking, all right, I have to take this uh, six damage this turn, but I can follow up with Lackey and Faceless to hopefully take down that Faceless uh, Rotness Drake. Mm -hmm. But the Bone Wraith will stop the damage coming through, at least for now. It is big mana for Chansu, though, so he might be looking at the Primordial Explorer. Just to fish for, I guess, exactly Fairy Dragon and not high odds. So he does end up defaulting to the Bone Raid. And this does actually allow him still to clear the board because of it being exactly the Goblin lucky here. Yeah. There's, of course, the option to evolve the 4-2 instead, give him a stronger board, but he is taking far too much damage for my liking that yeah. I would like to see Kin just be responsible and clear off the 6-5. So many options. He does have Galakrond in hand, which could allow him to... Uh... Right. Oh yeah, the phrase makes far more sense here. Yeah, sorry, yeah, same thing. Uh, but I was thinking he could take the damage and heal up, but even having said that. You just go for the clear. This is the way you're losing against Demon Hunt, uh, against Highlander Hunter is by taking too much Whoa. damage. Look at this draw from Chansu. That is perfect yeah, for that the is situation. By moon and spear. It's not a lot of pressure, but it allows Chansu to put two minions on board and also remove Kins, which removes the out of, or the powerful play of Witchy Lackey. So I think we're far from seeing Kin forced into going for the Galakrond here. He still has the potential for some pretty strong plays, like that one in particular. Yeah, the Bone Wraith with Rush allowed him to VT into the scale, oh, yes. right? You still maintain a taunt. I am looking at the Shiv just to give him more cycle. After the Bone Wraith gets played, Kin's hand is looking wants to delay the Galakron further for a bigger straight swing. I wonder. I'm seeing the merit of all three of these. It, like as you're entering turn seven onwards, you're kind of expecting one big minion a turn to come down. Oh. Which incentivizes See? ambush. I'm not a fan of the evolve over the rush here. There's a poison on board that right. the full health bone wraith doesn't seem very strong at all. I agree. Yeah, I think he could have just soaked up a lot more damage. Mm -hmm. He could be thinking to save the Goblin Lackey for a more threatening minion later on. Mm -hmm. But in time, he's 
only got this blowtorch at the moment to pair with it. Granted, Galakron could draw him into something more powerful to rush, like Togwaggle. It's true, Togwaggle, Kronk's Edwin, all that good stuff does mitigate a lot of damage, but this is a problem that you're seeing right now, that you know that you can yeah. uh, delete more damage off the board with the rush. I do love deleting damage. With the Siamat off the top for Chansu, it's a great on-curve play, but the second half of the Bone Wraith is pretty awkward for him. Mm -hmm. quickly. Of the south. Come to my aid. At the most aggressive option. Wow. Given that if he went, say, Rush Divine Shield, he was only removing an additional three damage off yeah. the board. I think this is actually fine. Gives him more pressure. It at the very least forces Kin to find a way to deal with this, which even though he's likely to be able to Ooh. find. Oh! It's not quite guaranteed, but speaking of disruption, Togwaggle, all of a sudden, you just can't play it. Agreed. It means leaving 12 damage from the Siamat alone. And so, Kin has to think about whether he wants to go Edwin and then rush the Edwin. Mm -hmm. And then Dagger. Or he could... Uh, it doesn't work out any other way, right? You can't clear off the 2 1, the 3 1, and the Siamat unless you go Rush and then. Uh, sorry, Edwin then Rush. But he does have a way to full clear. He can go Blowtorch and then Rush that, which allows him to trade that plus the 3 2 and then clear off everything. And it sure. also does leave a Lackey on board, which sets up for Togwaggle next turn. I think the other play would have left him with. A lackey and a 3 2 on board. But he takes damage using the dagger. Mm -hmm. How about a new line? So, this is the healthiest Kin can be, and he saves the Edwin for Plecron. Could still get very big. That single turn was deceptively huge there for Chonsu, mm -hmm. because Big Ol' Welp was looking very tempting there, just to try and fill out more of his mana. But he goes for the full deny on Togwaggle, and Woo! oh my goodness, is he rewarded. But at the same time, oh my god, is Kin rewarded. That is insane. It is a one-draw Galakron, but the best possible draw to develop a 6-8. Back in the game. He's got Togwaggle next turn. Uh-huh. Active with the one played on that turn. <sighs> and Chansu could just say... I'm not respecting this 14 damage. Let me develop Dragon Queen. Mm -hmm. A lot of stats on the backswing, but the Varanus allows him to trade down the 8 8 this turn. If he corrosive hits breath. corrosive breath in particular, he can clear off the entire board. Huge pickup. This has been so back and forth. Love to really see has. it. We're going to see Kin go for the wand now, leaving seven on board. But still might have enough time to swing this if he gets an insane result from this Togwaggle. I'm thinking Lick. Yep, so am I. Even Shield of Galakron would be huge. Whoa! Whoa! That's the clear! And still, he's back in the game. Again, he hasn't won. We're still looking at a Dragon Queen Alexstrasza who can come down next turn. Life and hope of but he's got damage on board. He's got this Eviscerate. He could make a huge Edwin, but... <gasps> Deadly shot as a one in three to be, uh, to be terrible. Uh... Kin's not playing the secret variant, so Flair draws a card, which is still worth considering, but probably not the option. I wonder. I think he takes the deadly for a two and three decent amount of removal on the board. Agreed. Because he's going to play them with the timeless, so he really just wants to remove the most ability for Kin to trade off the board. Oh, oh the worst oh, one! Oh, 
This is a huge amount of stats for Kin to try and find a way to clear off, but it's possible. It really oh, it's happening! It's n not possible to go assassinate Ivis and Edwin, but he can keep her stab. Again, it's crucial that you mentioned he's not playing the secret variant because the blackjack stunner for easy removal is not available in this variant. But now he can still just go assassinate one of the 8-8s, double trade into the other. By Mistress Edwin. By Mistress Edwin, exactly. If you're going for a big Edwin, you probably don't want Bamboozle. <laughs> so I, I like Correct. deviating from that. Yeah. Yeah, the eviscerate, as I can see, it doesn't even allow him to clear an additional minion the way that the health Darkness lines freeze. up. He wants to assassinate Kalagos, right? Or not? Really? I don't think so. What are they going to do with really? zero mana spells each turn? They don't That's get a new true. discover. That's true. There's hardly any cards left in the hand anyway. Yeah. More damage removed. Safer. Edwin lives! If it's Leoc plus Unleash? Six, five, still one off. Still lives. You're right. Oh my god, yeah. dear. This is just going to become oh. a, a straight up race at this point. It really is. And. Leaving up Kalagos <laughs> versus an 8 8 was crucial there. Yeah. Yeah, my mistake because if he rolled Huffer, that Edwin was dead win. Exactly. Whoa! Oh my goodness. <laughs> These rolls are insane. Eviscerate Misha, trade Spire Mistress in to the big ol' well, put Chonsu on a two turn clock. Oh! Kills never mind. <laughs> Okay, trades the Caligos, I guess, to play around Zephyrus into finding a clear on the Edwin. But it still finds a clear in the Edwin. Right, right but then you've oh. cleared off their big guy. The Caligos. <sighs> I mean, it, I, I don't know. It does play I around Zephyrus. I feel like Zephyrus. if they get the Zephyrus, you lose any. Maybe. Tough to say. I was definitely expecting that to go face though, I've got to say, that was a bit jarring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Edwin does get to live another turn though. Kin's hand is full of nothing at the moment. There are two lackeys that he really wants to get. Draconic and Ethereal. But even without those, he could just set up a board haunted and he has enough damage for exactly. two so. And he's basically just saying please Chonsu, do not hit your Zephyrus. Zephyrus. Does he even taunt up something else just to protect the Edwin against Dino Tamer Bran? Sure. Could go shot bot, haunt the shot bot, witchy lackey. Yeah. Just play the whole hand at this right. point. You've seen Unleash. I mean, Chatsu's hand is empty, so everything that you're playing around is just a top deck. A 1 in 10. I really like taunting up not the Edwin here. Very smart. And there's the brand! Whoa! That is huge that he protected this from the Fairy Dragon and Bran trading into it. And now he's just won! Pretty brilliant from Kin. You love to see it. A lot of these games today have been go going more back and forth than I'm used to seeing them. And you know what? That is great. Even the Druid mirrors are falling in line. Yeah, we're seeing a lot less one-sidedness here in APAC. But while in the last series, it was all chuckles and smiles from both of the players as they were doing cheesy broken stuff turn after turn. There for Chonsu, he looks that little bit more downtrodden. Oh, uh, a one and three he is at at the moment, sorry, versus the O oh and four for Kin. It's not quite so dire, but if he does lose, they are both equal right down at the bottom at one and four. So Chonsu, the pressure is mounting already. Indeed, especially because 
the closer you are to the bottom and facing off against these people who are also there, the more the head to head tiebreakers matter. Yeah. The other person in this equation that I suppose is worth mentioning is Surrender, also close to the bottom, but recently got a win. So less in danger. The yeah. Chansu versus Kin matchup is so crucial for Kin to equalize. It is so crucial. All these matches mean so much. Obviously, down at the bottom of Division A, you are not facing automatic relegation. You have to play out a four-player bracket along with fifth and sixth of B, the last player of which will be eliminated in addition to the two automatic relegations. But when you start getting into this process, uh, this headspace, all of a sudden you're just starting to be convinced that fate is against you. It will be you eliminated out because you're getting so unlucky, especially after Chonsu had such a good start to that game. So I hope he's able to keep a good, uh, calm uh, demeanor and a good headspace heading into the rest of the series because he is going to need it one game down up against Kin. Can Chonsu turn things around? We'll find out after this. Goodness gracious, Eddie. Not happy to see that. What was his draw? Oh. Slice? Oh wow. my goodness. Oh my double goodness. We have a new member in the Hall of Champions. That is the most insane thing I've ever seen happen in Hearthstone. Welcome back once again to Hearthstone Grandmasters for our third match of the day. A slightly more downbeat one compared to Glory versus Ali Temu, which ended in a very cool way with the shades whipped out for Ali Temu. But I don't think we're going to be seeing any of that from Chonsu or Kinji, as both players are facing relegation, potential relegation, straight in the face. Of course, they are in Division A, but still things are looking scary, especially for Chonsu, who is one game down. Indeed. We keep talking about to head tiebreaker matters more than most matches for these two particular players fighting it out at the bottom of Division A. And up next, we're going to have a good old-fashioned Demon Hunter 
mirror. So this is one of the classes that we're not particularly concerned about when it comes to the grand scheme of things in Conquest, mm -hmm. because we expect them to get a win at some point. But I actually think this is one of the mirrors where you can really see the experience of the players shine through. I completely agree with you, Gia. I think we have seen consistently a lot of misunderstanding being shown with Demon Hunter specifically, because it is, while very powerful, a very difficult deck to play, and you need to know all the little tricks of the trade that you can use to pull things into your advantage. We did get to see that, sorry, one of the cool tech inclusions from Kin now that Crimson Sigil Runner has moved by the wayside for most players, Mana Burn. Which, again, we've talked about how needing to know when to play your Frozen Shadow Weaver is important. What are the key terms to go for then? Knowing when to play Mana Burn is an entirely different skill. What are the key turns that you're trying to reduce the mana from your opponent? Yeah, it's largely over with the Frodo Weaver turns, coincidentally. Turn 3 and 5 are some of the turns where Demon Hunter really wants to speak and consolidate their board or put a lot of burst into action so i think kin will be looking to save that mana burn for one of those Whoa. it's difficult for him here though because if he wants to coin it out he would be foregoing a coin glaive bound right. option later on which if i had to hazard a guess i think is more important to do it the way he is doing it frozen shadow either oh, on the following turn i think is looking very very powerful and then, of course, hopefully, Coin Glaive Bound. Although, this play from Chonsu may force Kin's hand into deviating. Yes, the Frozen Shadow Weaver this turn is far less impactful because the Satyr Overseer has already hit the board, and Chonsu would be less incentivized to attack with his face uh, on the following turn because Kin's first priority would be to clear off that Overseer in the yep. first place. We're seeing from Kin clearing uh, no off way. playing the mana burn while it is available with what he is going to do with the rest of the turn. Saving the coin for something later on. The problem is he's used both charges of Umber Wing, so he can't just mount a glaive bound. Do you think we were therefore actually supposed to see coin Shadow Weaver on two from Kin instead of developing the Umber Wing? Just because it plays around Overseer so heavily? I think it was worth considering, yes. Is it cold mm. in the shadows? Still, these 5 of course, locks out Absolutely. war glaives. It dis uh, allows Chansu from buff his battle fiend at all. The upside yeah, for Chansu is he's got the cane. This has just been worked out so beautifully by uh, Kin here. Even though, you know, I was saying it was worth considering the coin Shadow Weaver. The upside of this is he gets the Shadow Weaver on one of the crucial turns. Like we were saying, turn 5, very important to go into. But then he still gets Coin Hero Power Glaive Bound Adept into the Metamorphosis. Powerful turn after hmm. powerful turn. It's curious though how this works out for Kin because without a Twin Slice in hand, he does have to coin out Hero Power for Glaive Bound where he would to play the sidekick on the Glaive Bound. True. Uh, to true. prevent it from getting Glaive Bound itself. We talk about this interaction far mm -hmm. too much, but it is just that crucial in the matchup. I think given how this is likely to shape out with Chonsu going Kane, and then I would have to expect a trade so that we can't see any devastating value trades um, from Kin. Uh, thereafter, just going coin hero power glaive bound, even though it's vulnerable to a glaive bound in response, it clears the Ooh. board right now. That, however, may just change things around. Yes, what a top deck from Kin here. Now he can clear off these minions and have the glaive bound plus sidekick active for later on. But it's getting to the point where he's got to be worried about freezes on the other side because hmm. Chonsu is also running Frozen Shadow Weaver himself. Suddenly, if you're setting up and basically telegraphing Warglaives into big swing, then the freeze is an even bigger punish because you're not able to develop the Glaive Bound with the Battle Cry, and you're also not able to get the other swings of the Warglaives. I really like the deviation. Okay. I think this First has been uh, one of the, the most consistent things we've seen about players who have been playing Demon Hunter at the highest level is just playing around what your opponent is most likely to do on the following turn. And even though Gladebound is clearly the most powerful thing he can do here, he knows his opponent is so likely to have a powerful response. So he response. So he's just making it awkward for his opponent. 
On top of that, thinking about how big a freeze punish could be mm -hmm. for this turn yeah. if he goes Warglaves, but he's actually just got the Metamorphosis to develop if a Frozen Shadow Weaver comes down this turn. So it works out pretty well for Kin. And now Chansu himself was hovering over the Warglaves trying to potentially set up a Seder Overseer for the following turn. Looks like he's gonna go for the Glaive Bound. Warglaves is very slow and also gets punished if Kin himself is not getting any minions. Mm -hmm. Chansu's gonna hope that the response isn't there, but he's gonna get the bad news that not only is it Glaive Bound, it's Glaive Bound with the sidekick. The Glaive Bound is bad. I think, to be perfectly honest though, at this point, the sidekick is not that bad. I mean, I guess Chonsu could have killed it off with a uh, just a hero power tacked on, but at this point, yeah. he's just going super aggressive. He's trying to close out the game in the next couple of turns. Yeah, I think that's his only option now. The sidekick made that easier for Chonsu in a weird way, but I also agree that he's got to go face. I think it's still a big deal that he can't use one charge to get rid of the Glaive Bound immediately. But the far million point is the fact that Kin is cutting heal from his deck. He's only playing one eye beam. And so is Chonsu, actually, I just noticed. Uh, Kin is playing one of Blowtorch Saboteur in the spot of the eye beam. And, and that means that the damage to face is near permanent. Exactly, and in addition to that, just to make it even better for Chonsu, he actually can clear it off with one hit when you factor in the twin slice as well. Then plows the rest base. He is setting up not lethal straight away, but very likely to be in the next couple of turns. I can't imagine that he wants to Me sink neither. a charge uh, Warglaves into the teaming sidekick. Yep. You can make the argument that he doesn't necessarily need all of the charges because the top decks could be more damage. But as it stands, <laughs> um, he does need it. So this yeah. is just a sure way to go about it. Oh, that wow. is a huge top deck though here for Kin. That is it huge. Really that is. might just be the difference maker. He has the time now to try and set up his own lethal Ooh. over the next couple of turns. I was going to say, this coin feels like it's hardly getting any value at this point, and something had to have gone wrong in the early turns if yeah. you're not playing it this early as Demon Hunter. But now, it allows Kin to develop an additional minion, the Blowtorch tech. <sighs> Maybe Demons. not that relevant, Demons. given that Chansu um, has hardly any cards in hand anyway, would, in theory, be able to spend that hero power through. Right. But the point here now is that if he coins the Blowtorch, he's not actually locking out lethal potential from Chansu because he's already frozen. So Chansu would be happy to get that 3 mana usage out of the way, free up the hero power for when he's not frozen, and be able to get off a bigger combo. And that's why Kin is holding on to the Blowtorch. I mean, to be honest, I, th I think the Blowtorch isn't really that impactful in terms of the hero power. It's just the body uh, that he was looking at setting up. But the way this works out, it's about even. I think it's actually exactly even with what it would be on the previous turn because he gets two damage on board, plus the one from the weapon, plus the one from the hero power that he could fit on on the previous turn sure. because it was one cheaper. But because the beaming sidekick can trade one in, that takes one out. So I think it equals at pretty much three damage gained either way on the next turn. Right. And the hero power, while not as impactful as earlier on the game, is not negligible. It probably locked some Fair. of the lethal outs from Chansu out. Say, mm, Glaive Bound plus the attack plus something else. Yeah, if an I Beam comes into play, then maybe Chonson right. is a little bit over, uh, not able to get there. Freeze is so backbreaking for Chonsu there. He just threw another weapon. The turn is either Tempo Overseer yep. or nothing at all. Question is whether he sends this beaming sidekick base or not. In terms of damage outs, I think that six is approximately equal to five because the Twin Slice deals two, Chaos Strike deals two. I'm not sure what he can top deck off the top that does one, but not two anyway. That is not any more damage though, however, for Kin. So we are looking at 
only 6, 7, 8, 13 damage, I think, as I count it. One of? Demons. Demons. Oh my god, Jira, it's so close! <laughs> it so always obviously, seems to come down to this. <laughs> you need to take off as much damage from the board as possible. I grow impatient. I am but, not sure if yeah. Derek is... Okay. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. here. I'm just Sorry, thinking, got... Gia. <laughs> thought you stopped in the middle of your sentence because Sato saying the weather broke. I thought the power in the UK went out. But glad to see you're still there because that was a really good trade from John who actually just saved him from dying straight up. Yeah. And now, there's top deck out. Wave bound, wind slice, chaos strike, metamorphosis. There are so many. But, but that is not, not it! One of them. Oh! oh no! That's just it. Chonsu chose to include this card in the deck. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's quite interesting how it's become his undoing in two situations now the other one versus surrender in the mirror where yeah. it seemed like it was more of a problem in his timing of when to unstealth and not even get good trades with the wargans he just went a little all into the face and now it's becoming a bad top deck crimson sigil runner would have been far better of course it is a very uh difficult for me to say it's strictly better or worse because earlier or all Oregon infiltrators could have made a huge difference, but man, that was painful for Chonsu. I mean, I think you put it just right. It's a perfect showcase of the power of Crimson Sigil Runner. It's one of the few one drops in the game that scales well into the late game. It's almost better in the late game than it is on turn one because of yeah. how much you want to hit your yeah. other one drops in the early game there. But oh man, my heart goes out to Chonsu. He was so close to getting the job done there. But I think overall for Kin, even though there were some. Uh, very valid other lines he could have taken in the early game. Uh, he set himself up for powerful plays on pretty much every turn with his line of play. Uh, he had the possibility come turn five of going hero power coin glaive bound if he wanted. He, of course, found something better with the war glaives off the top, uh, which he was correct in deviating to, of course. But he always had a plan in mind, which is the cornerstone of Demon Hunter gameplay. You have to plan out what all your turns are going to be. It was just crazy to me that he stayed ahead of the game for the majority, despite going second and not using the coin. Yeah, that really true. unheard of to me for Demon Hunter mirrors, but we are going to another very familiar mirror in which both players have drawn the dream. But Kin's dream is a little bit more fantastic. Is it? it? It it's close. I guess the fact that he at the moment has innovate means that he can get the first glow fly down. But mm -hmm. if Chonsu is able to get his own spicy draw oh! here, okay, I thought that was an innovate. <laughs> <sighs> oh, wrong golden. Yep, my bad. Yeah, if Chonsu were to get his own innervate, the matchup just flips on its head. Like a very salient point. That is just how the druid mirror works. So Kin looking at a likely five or six, six card even. Oh, blow fly oh, on the following turn, but Chonsu hit the innovate off the top. I'm just a psychic, Derek. Ah. One turn too early. How dare you doubt me? What is happening, Gia? Druids. Druids are happening. That's all you can say. Just good job, Chonsu. <laughs> we had our back and forth druid mirror of the day. No longer. More than we no could longer. ask for. <laughs> <laughs> it, it happened before this. Turn four, dear. Turn four lethal with druid. What has happened to my beautiful game here as Chonsu <laughs> goes up to at least one game on the table now? That's more like it from him there. Okay, I'm glad we're seeing a bit of the old Chonsu back. <laughs> mean what happened to your beautiful game? This is beautiful game. Yeah, you're this right. This is Apex bread and butter. Yeah, exactly. I am as degenerate as the next uh, 
uh, player here. I would happily do that to my opponents all the live long day. But there for Chonsu, <laughs> finally getting the win with the Druid. Now, that has been, I think, for a lot of people, the uh, the lagging point in their lineup. Even though he's got Hunter, Demon Hunter, Druid now played with all of his decks so far, getting that out of the way, I think, puts him in a much better spot because now up against the Druid for Kin, Chonsu has to take a win with the Demon Hunter and the Hunter, both of which I think are very winnable matchups, arguably even favored on both halves. Hunter, I would struggle to say it is actually favored for Hunter. Definitely close mm -hmm. because they have the idea to just snowball a lot in the early game. I will say, though, the Demon Hunter is looking in a very good spot. And we are going to see Chansu queue up the Demon Hunter first, try to get that momentum rolling for what's possibly a harder matchup later on. And that is a pretty strong start. I just see Battle Fiend, I see Umberwing, I see a way to put the Battle Fiend out of range of a single Wrath. This is the dream for Chansu. He just needs to find himself an Overseer, and all of a sudden he is miles and miles in the lead. Orkin, though, he does have Wild Growth into Glowfly. But he will be taking a beating in the meantime. Okay, I well... think he should punch this Battle Fiend and just Bog Beam it next turn. Okay, that saves the Moonfire. I was going to say he has Bog Beam Moonfire, but this is even better. You can then just save it for another spell for Glowfly or the Mount Cellar later on. Uh, the problem with Bog Beam next turn is he can't Wild Growth. But the thing is, the Glowfly is not looking particularly right. strong for the follow-up because he's got a minion in hand and hasn't drawn any cards. Kin is just tanking it. All right. Is it cold in the shadows? You keep making the point, Druid, they need to do something proactive to actually win the matchup and not just remove, but there are uh, spots for deviation. I would yeah. have at least liked to see Kin think it a little bit longer. It really reminds me actually of how Quest Druid sometimes forgoes an earlier quest activation in favor of removing something. Stay alive that little bit longer. And while I don't think we have lethal quite yet for Chonsu, it is staggeringly close for this point in the game. Yep. And he's got the Warglaves follow up if it 15. isn't lethal. Yeah. I think everything is just that one turn too slow for Kin. He can't pop off in time. Mm -hmm. oh, he definitely cannot pop <laughs> off in time. Even Only consideration. If we were to look at a innervate off the top for overflow, I don't okay. think it gets there. Well, he at least has a full board of tutus to start trading in. The problem is they line up fairly awkwardly. But I mean, with the moonfire, he can take off most of the damage from the board here. He can, and then, but it has to remove literally all of it to not be dead to just a Warglaves. That activates Bog Beam, um, which then doesn't win him the game. So we go on to the next draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking for crystal powers, and I said plural because I don't know if just one him there. I think one keeps him alive for the turn. Okay, he can trade down. Three minions, Moonfire, one, uh, trade on four minions, along with... Yep. Yeah. He can... If he really wants to innervate hero power, but probably at this point, you just uh, save it for your Mount Cellar turn. That's gonna kill him, though, oh. however. <laughs> wait. Oh, no, wait. One off. It's one, one damage off. off. Oh, no, wait. It is lethal again. It is again. lethal with the bounce. Sorry, I was looking at Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Took us a second as well, but Chonsu will yeah. be able to equalize the series on turn five. Man, when Chonsu wins, he really wins. It doesn't even seem close. Our enemies yeah. fall. It does not. But now, Gia, this was the easy one out of the way. He was taking the right. almost freebie with Demon Hunter on Druid. Now, of course, things get a little bit tougher. This is coming down. To Highlander Hunter up against Druid, a matchup that I've done a, a little bit of testing on. And I mean, I think I'm right in saying, Gia, that it is just about the Hunter being as aggressive as they possibly can in the early game. Yeah, I completely agree with you. The fairy dragons are especially backbreaking for Druid. We see, uh, we saw a while ago Surrender taking a very 
with Hunter by starting off with that amazing curve, having the Fey Wing, and yeah. uh, crucially, just playing a Reza 6-5. Because Druid, while it can get a very strong start if you don't go for the super early Glowfly, yeah. it can just be that one turn too slow. It really is just the difference of one turn with Druid between dying and absolutely popping off and turning the game on its head. And just the implications of this game alone in terms of the standings here are oh, yeah. so huge. If Chonsu is taking the win, that means Kin is decidedly at the bottom with 0 and 5 over uh, after his first five games would be a devastating way to start things off. But if Chonsu loses here and Kin takes the win, that means that they are both kind of stranding each other down at the bottom, looking to be likely playing out for that relegation spot. Yep. As it stands, though, Chansu's opener is so good. He's got Fairy Dragon, Stormhammer. Zeph's if he wants it to shore up a turn where he oh, doesn't yes. have good development. And Kin has an early overgrowth. I mean, early as right now if he wants it. Yeah. He's going to go for development, actually, here. The punishes are... Not too limited, to be honest, both the weapons and uh, the scale rider, which has been backbreaking. Uh, I think punish is a bit of a strong way to put that. It still soaks up the weapon damage, right? And it, it's developing sure. something that at least extends his time to start finding his power cards. Yep. And it's not like uh, he is lacking indoor, he still has the other end of the rising winds, but the exactly. dragon bane for Chonsu just. Gives Kin a very oh. clear timer. It does, but wow. look at that draw off the top. All of a sudden now, Kin has one game plan oh and one my. game plan only, Gia. This is the mother of all mount sellers next turn. Yes, it really is. Just a question of how Kin approaches this turn is crucial. Is he going to put more minions onto the board, try and stall? Or does he draw to find bog beams for next turn? Or iron bar? He's committing all into the board. Diving Griffin does fairly easily allow Chonsu to guarantee the five damage to go face. Yes. Does he want that though, or would he rather get the five damage just for free removal? So tough to say. Yeah. I think we're at the point where Chonsu can still Presumably, soak more or sorry, get more damage from a minion over two turns versus the five to face immediately. So I get, I can get behind him going for this line. But this is gonna have to be a great mount seller. I'm talking Griffin Gia, and I'm talking pretty much only diving Griffin can pull him out of this one. Taunts would be great as well, but none of which are available, and that's just GG with Zephyrus. Yeah, Zephyrus off the top, that can give Fireball for the win. Yeah, have a drawer. However which pick. way you like it. As long as he doesn't fall into the trap of hero powering first. <laughs> I think even then he's got lethal here. Yes, with Frostbolt. And then you swing face. Yeah. Are, He's just double, so triple checking. Yeah, just making sure Zephyrus has no room to make yep. any mistakes here. That is so rough for Kin. Getting swept on the Druid every time Chansu has gotten a strong start. And Chansu, look at the difference. He is so ecstatic to be pulling himself out of the hole and putting that distance between him and Kin. That's so right, Gia. Kin commiserations to him, but just look at what this means to, uh, to Chonsu. I don't think I've seen elation on a player's <laughs> like that. Yeah. A player's face like that at all in my time casting GM. That is just true and utter relief of the highest order, saying, you know what? I'm hopefully not going to end up at the bottom. He has a real chance to turn things around. His score isn't even that bad. Two and three puts him even with Surrender, Possessi, and right. Flurry. He is all of a sudden way above the bottom now and can start his yeah. road to redemption. Whereas for Kin, 0-5, he's guaranteed to be bottom two, I think, now. Yeah, 
all but guaranteed. And Chansu, despite him having a very slow start, not only is he two and three and tied with three other players, he has the head to head advantage versus surrender after. So Brilliant. he might be pulling himself not just out of seventh place, but out of the relegation bracket spots in Division A altogether. It is a huge difference that one series could make. Absolutely right. I am very, very glad for Chonsu, though, all things considered. I think that he played that a lot more like the Chonsu that we expect to see, especially those last couple of games against the Druid. Obviously, you know, he got pretty much the ideal hands, but I think he knew exactly what he was looking for and played some very strong Hearthstone. And that is yet another story of defeat for Druid. This has not been Druid's weekend. It seems to be taking wins in the mirror and pretty much just that. Uh, we're not seeing the amazing fungal fortune starts of old, but we've seen decent starts from Druid is the thing. We've seen a ton of glow flies. We've seen a ton of ramp. But the more I see this deck, the more I tend to realize that if it's not that exact combo of fungal, wild growth slash overgrowth, and fun and uh, Glowfly Swarm, it's not right. enough. Yeah, exactly. It's starting to show its real weakness. There's just a decent deck, but not that oppressively powerful. Maybe not a all but one bring here uh, for Asia Pacific at least. But we're going to take a look at the schedule now to see what we have coming up for the rest of the day, as that was, of course, only game three. We still have now the Division B matches to play out. Just Staz versus Shaxi, I think, should be a good one. They're kind of middle of the road, a little bit lower down on the scores than they would like to be. But the big one for me is undisputably the bottom two players in all of APAC Grandmasters, Frosty and Samuel Sal, trying to fight it out just to have some chance of pulling it back out of the bottom two. That's right. Both of them winless thus far in the round robin stage and also on stream, including the Swiss, if I recall. Mm -hmm. So they have so much to prove. And Samuel Sal is bringing the only mage deck of APAC this weekend. And it's not the Highlander mage. I cannot wait to see us getting into that. Yeah, I've got a lot to say about uh, Samuel Sow and his mage deck. Some of it uh, kind, some of it not, as that is a, uh, <laughs> a bit of a, uh, a, a pile of cards, is what I will call that mage deck, <laughs> if nothing else. But before we can get into that, we're going to go <sighs> to a slightly longer break, as we always do after game three. So do whatever you need to do to get ready for the last couple of matches today, because you are absolutely not going to want to miss them. We will be back with Staz versus Shaxi after this break. 